So, confession time, class. I've never played a Bloody Roar game in my life up until I did this one. I know the series existed, certainly. I just didn't get around to it for some reason. I mean, I've always liked fighting games, but not as much as a lot of other genres, in case my particular proclivity towards RPGs hasn't been plenty apparent by now. But then my two closest Tomodachi bros, Kog and Kitaku, each approached me separately from one another, telling me to review one of the newer Bloody Roar games, and, well, let's just say it seemed like a sign to me then, if not before. So welcome to the Snack Discover slash Snack Suite. Join me for a closer look at Bloody Roar Primal Fury. Greetings everyone, this is the Hipster Snack, and today we'll be looking at the Gaiden title Bloody Roar Primal Fury. Originally released on the Nintendo GameCube in 2002, and re-released for the Xbox a year later with the new Extreme subtitle, this game was set to be a side story happening between the events of Bloody Roar 3 and 4. Not that I know what those events are, but thankfully there's a fan wiki, and it does help give me some context clues. I shall now, in my limited capacity, attempt to explain this story. Fans, feel free to froth in the mouth in the comments section should I make a mistake along the way. So, in this world, there are people called zoanthropes, people who can turn into half-animal hybrid forms, basically. And for reasons that, I assume, stem from an allegory for racism, humans and zoanthropes have had a series of full-scale conflicts with them throughout their history. That being said, and the zoanthropes being public knowledge since the canon ending of Bloody Roar 2, a new nation, the Zoanthrope Kingdom, is established in place not specified, whereupon a great championship for Zoanthropes is held, attracting combatants from all over the world with its generous cash prize offering. The World of Coexistence, a commercial enterprise dedicated to bridging the gap between regular humans and their beast-like brethren, gets involved too, which brings in a good number of the protagonists from the previous games into the fray. And then we learn that the leader of the Zoanthrope Kingdom, King Orion, may well be somewhat dishonest as his son Kronos joins the tournament, apparently keen to stop some of his own father's deeds along the way. That's about what I can parse, so let's punch some animals. Graphically, the game looks good. It's clear they wanted to take advantage of the hardware of the times, and the GameCube does have muscle to spare. The effort's on the screen. Every fighter has two, and in some cases more than two modes, between a human state and their beast form, and both look super cool. Special props to Gato the Lion and Stun the Insect with some of the coolest transformations in the game. The levels also have fantastic designs, with the ability to ring your enemy out a la Soul Calibur is both a reality and a very cathartic way of concluding a battle. The stages are mostly just square arenas, but that feeling of blowing the wall out as my opponent takes a tumble? Haha, <laughs> that just feels sadistically good. Audio-wise, I like the soundtrack, but I'll also say it's nothing amazing. I enjoy hearing it in context, but it never really stuck with me moments after playing. And the voice cast is… well, it was 2002, so for what it was, it was pretty good. Special attention should be paid to the sound effects, however, which make every impact so satisfying. And uh, that's enough of that, let's get into the gameplay. Mechanically, well, it's a 2.5D fighting game. Your buttons make you punch, kick, block, and transform into your beast form, and the shoulder buttons make you slide left to right along the Z-axis. Now, what's interesting here is how the game balances your animal shape-shifting power. Your beast gauge goes up as you deal and take hits, but you can transform before it's completely filled. Though it lasts for a shorter time, and powerful moves called beast drives will force you back to your human form upon executing them. And here's where some curiosities I noticed while playing come in. For starters, your beast form hits harder, but they tend to be on the slower side. Poor Stun, for instance, is remarkably sluggish in his giant rhino beetle morph. Whereas characters who are more lightweight, like Alice the White Rabbit, haha, I see what you did there, game devs, only trades a small bit of her impressive speed for a noteworthy power up in the strength department. But because the beast morphs are temporary, it makes your timing of them all the more pivotal, as even the moment of transformation can be weaponized, as nearby rivals will be hurled backwards from the shock, giving you a chance to catch your breath. I also noticed that when you take damage, part of your health bar will then turn blue and start regenerating slowly over time meaning long stretches of avoiding damage can put you back into the fight if luck is on your side. Likewise, there's even the Hyper Beast mode, by using the Z-Trigger which will force you into a flashy, glowing beast form that will take from your health bar what it cannot from your beast gauge. 
a risky trade-off that might result in a win if you play your card smartly. Plus, the game has a ton of game modes, including standard arcade versus time attack and survive modes, but also with a team battle versus team battle and training modes to get your practice in. And the rest, as they say, is history. You smash and tear your opponents to pieces using simple attack commands modified by the directional inputs as it should be. Furries destroying other furries as God intended. Where I define fault, it's just that some characters are simply better. In my first play of team mode, I encountered Uranus the Chimera, a character you have to unlock to use in the first place, and she just absolutely bounced me across the field. And Xeon the Unborn, when he transforms, if he gets a singular hit on you, is going to feel rather entitled to the subsequent 20 he'll then get afterward, because stopping him is just not going to happen. Or the most comedically frustrating sort, Kronos the Penguin, who in his regular beast form is so tiny you have to crouch to hit him, and he'll just bombard you with non-stop attacks to your knees, which makes coping with him rather nightmarish. Not helped by the fact that his Hyper Beast state is an SNK boss, Kronos the Phoenix, who will also just end you, but for entirely different reasons. There are strict tiers, and it's tough to cope with them if you aren't playing to the tune of the metagame, and that's incredibly frustrating to me. All that being said, how does the game measure up overall? It's good. It's not amazing. It's by no means bad, it's good, solid, competent, entertaining. The very definition of a 7 out of 10, it was okay experience. It's overall a good fighting game, and it makes the most of its home as a GameCube spin-off side story title, and for anyone who wants an onboarding point, you could definitely do worse. It's somewhat of a shame that the only follow-up to this game would be Bloody Roar 4, the last game the franchise has seen since 2004. And in a way, I can't help but think that that's a bit of a shame. I had a lot of fun with this. I see so much potential yet untapped in my time playing it. So knowing I might never see it acted upon is a little bit of a depressing thought now that I've discovered the series for myself. And in my rudimentary web search, I wasn't able to find out who has the license now, if anybody. I'd be deeply curious to know. So let me know in the comments if you guys find out. This has been Hipster the Snack, bringing today an underappreciated gem from almost 20 years ago now back into the limelight. If you liked today's episode, hit the like button so I know. And for more like this each week, hit the subscribe and bell icon so you'll never miss a one. We're updating five days a week now here at Channel Snack, including obscure reviews, snack talks, let's plays, and the new home of the Tomodachi Bros anime and movie podcast YouTube Mirror, where my two closest bros join me here to talk about all sorts of good stuff. And if you want to support the channel, you can go to my subscribe star, link in the description every time. So join us here each week for more like this, and I will see you there.